Continuing along the same lines, uh, with Ray's, Ray Kurzweil's law of accelerating returns, the men, vile men's will get smaller and smaller when we'll be talking more about uh, nanomedicine. <clears throat> Including uh, the reverse engineering of the brain um, and uh, artificial intelligence. And just to give you some examples of some of the things that are going on, uh, or an illustration of the law of accelerating returns. It, this was used with permission from Ray Kurzweil. Uh, his brain scanning image reconstruction time. You can see uh, the changes in time from the year from 1970 to 2005. And certainly, uh, as part of the law of accelerating returns, and as we're seeing, we're going to see the incredible shrinking computer in a few years. And this is Ray Kurzweil predict. Ray Kurzweil's predictions. I don't know exactly how accurate they will be. I can tell you that many of his predictions have been very accurate. So, anticipated by 2015, we won't be needing our laptops because we'll have images written right onto our retinas, and they'll be ubiquitous, high-bandwidth connection uh, to the internet at all times, which raises issues of privacy and interconnectedness, um, and electronics so tiny that it'll be embedded into our, our clothing and our eyeglasses, full immersion, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, which I understand somebody is doing a talk here on the military, I had done, and my sister and I had done a paper on augmented uh, cognition, all the legal and ethical issues regarding that. Um, and certainly for language technologies, and I think that's particularly exciting because that will help break down some of the barriers um, in language, and we'll be able to communicate more freely. <clears throat> now, one of the more interesting, one of the most interesting, one of the most exciting aspects, I think, of um, enhancement or nanotechnology is nanoneural interfaces. Um, we are advancing and learning uh, about, the, about what the brain can do, and there have been a number of companies that are focusing on repair of damaged portions of the brain by using something called uh, nanoneural knitting. So, such a quaint phrase. <laughs> nanoneural knitting. It is uh, to um, uh, help with damaged hippocampus, ham, hippocampi, I guess it would be the plural, <laughs> of hippocampus, uh, and uh, enhancing neural capabilities beyond uh, our natural capabilities. And now, some of you have thought, I've heard some comments made that this is somewhat fantastical, but this is stuff that is going on now and in vitro uh, experiments uh, uh, currently. So we, there are chips now that can sense the onset of seizures and suppress them via implanted brain uh, stimulators for Parkinson's uh, patients. Um, there are currently interfaces with limbs, uh, neuroprosthetics and disabled limbs that are going on. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, augmented brain memory function to replace damaged hippocampal structures uh, for people who have suffered from short-term uh, memory loss, and those are in clinical trials. So this is a picture of the uh, uh, nanoneural knitting. A lot of this is still in just uh, animal testing, but it is in late stage animal testing and we expect uh, I've heard from this conference that I attended in Magog with a couple of my colleagues here um, just last month that these will be moving into uh, clinical trials in, within the next few years. Um, the fellow who had, uh, has done much of this work, his name is Robert Scobassi, and there's also Rutledge Ellis Banke, who is, um, I think, from University of Rome. So um, we get down into some very, very interesting philosophical questions here about, well, what is it that makes humans unique? And I'm not sure that there is anything. I, I think it is more a question of breadth and scope than it is in perhaps individual qualities. So you can, I 
little bit of humor here, a cartoon where humans can, only humans can play ping pong. Well, no, that doesn't work anymore. Only humans can drive cars. Well, that doesn't work anymore. Um, and by 2029, we'll be looking at a real intimate merger. Uh, if you follow the law of accelerating returns, $1,000 worth of computation by that time will be 1,000 times uh, computation, a thousand times the computation of the human brain. And computers will be able to pass the Turing test, um, and non-biological intelligence will continue to grow exponentially. Now, which brings us into a whole other philosophical um, and, and uh, interesting question about what constitutes intelligence, because intelligence is just not mere processing. It's not just the ability to uh, solve mathematical problems. There are a variety of levels and, and types of intelligence. Social intelligence, the ability to interact with people. Uh, street smarts is what we used to call it. So now we've started breaking it down. So it brings in all these different uh, disciplines, psychology, and the recognition that intelligence is much more than mere computational power. So that's uh, something that we will have to address and think about. Uh, but these neural implants, okay, these neural implants uh, will that we're working on will be non-invasive, surgery-free. Uh, We'll have the ability to distribute them to millions of points. Uh, and we get into issues of, will, can you be somebody else? Can you actually change your identity and your uh, characteristics? The issue of enhancement is uh, something we've been discussing all today. And it's been pointed out that Sometimes there's a clear cut point between therapy and enhancement, and sometimes there is not. With all due respect to the morning's earlier speaker, I think that sometimes it is very hard to tell the difference. There are a number of things that we have used, or we have developed for therapy that have turned out to be for enhancement. Just for example, a couple of them would be uh, minoxidil was used for um, to control, I'm sorry, uh, Viagra was used to control blood pressure. Okay, and now it's used for, well, I'm sorry? You, you've, just made the, <laughs> you've just made the distinction yourself. You just said it was used for therapy, now it's used for enhancement. Right, and what I'm saying is you can't say, oh, let's not make this for enhancement if you're using it for therapy. Right, but you can distinguish the uses. You can distinguish the uses to some extent. To some extent. What about vaccines? It's a byproduct. What happens is, let's say, another example is uh, vaccines. What happens by giving people vaccines for polio uh, and for H uh, uh, hepatitis, you've enhanced their immune systems against other diseases. That's so it becomes a byproduct. That's, that's, that's just rhetoric. That's just just rhetoric? Okay, so, well, now we're getting into... Well, because you just find enhancement that way, but that's... Okay. okay, so but the point is that I'm making is that we have enhanced our lifespans. We have taken our lifespans from 48 to 78 as a byproduct of many of uh, our technological developments. Now, um, G GMR is Genetics Nanotechnology Robotics, so short for that. Um, well, they help uh, stimulate our creativity, but they also can lead to our to, to destructiveness. But we have lessons to learn from the past. Ethical guidelines can be um, can be implemented, and some of the lessons, some of the places we can learn from are the Asilomark guidelines. The Asilomark guidelines, for those of you who don't know. Some of you may have been around, well, those of you who are in the, here still in, here in the 70s may remember the whole uh, hubbub about uh, recombinant DNA and the dangers of recombinant DNA. What happened was the um, uh, NIH put together uh, a conference with 140 people and came up with the Silmar guidelines to guide the development of um, recombinant DNA. It was a bit relaxed for some people. It was a bit too restrictive for some people. 
And, you know, as a lawyer, I'm quite comfortable.